and welcome to the latest in the series of UK Climate Resilience webinars. So my name is Mark Harrison and I'm one of the work package leads for the Met Office side of the programme. Um, today it's my pleasure to welcome Jamie Hannaford, who will be speaking about the Enhanced Future Flows in Groundwater, or EFLAG, project. The project falls into the Met Office Work Package 3, which looks to learn from the development of prototype climate services. This project is very much focusing on the creation of updated data sets of interest to the water sector as they consider resilience to drought events. The project is currently in its final stages, which is why it's great to have Jamie along to present some of their work. Following this, we'll have a user response from Stuart, Stuart Allen, who's a principal scientist at the Environment Agency. And to round things off, we'll have a question and answer session. So just a usual slide by means of a reminder. As I've just, as I've just mentioned, please add your questions uh, to the Q&A box as you listen to Jamie and Stuart's presentation and upvote each other's questions as appropriate. We will be muting everyone during the presentation unless you're invited to speak. The session will be recorded and will be on YouTube. And if you've got any technical project uh, problems, um, please post those in the chat and someone will take a look at that. So just before we go into the presentations, um, I've been asked to share a few news items. So firstly, uh, that the new embedded research cohort has been announced with eight awards being made. You can see from the slides that there's quite a range of topics being covered. Um, and more details can be found on the UK Climate Resilience website. Next up is news that the, the Climate Indicators Project has just launched a website that is aimed very much at individuals and organisations who want to get a better handle on how climate risks are changing in their local area. So please check out this website, uk-cri.org, uh, UK to check out the details on the methods and to explore the tool a little further. And finally, just to recognise the way in which UK climate resilience projects and staff have contributed to COP, there's been a huge amount going on. And this is just really a small snapshot of some of our contributions. I know that there's loads more being made, either in person or virtually. So thank you to everyone who's been involved with that. So just by means of um, an introduction, Jamie uh, leads this project. Um, he currently works for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and is also a visiting professor at the Irish Climate and Research Units at Maynooth University. He specialises in the analysis of hydrological extremes concerning floods and droughts and has led a number of U major UK and inter international drought research projects. So. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks very much. Um, I've just tried to uh, start restart my video, but it's not um, it's not enabling me to do that. So if I could just pass that on to the host. Um, yeah, it's saying that I can't because the host has stopped it. So if you do want the video on, that will oh, it's just come pop back on. That's good news. Okay, so well, thank you, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. So hopefully you can see the presentation come through now, Mark. All, all okay? Good. It's good. Okay. Um, right. Well, thank you everyone for attending this webinar on the uh, on the eFlag project. And so I'm going to be introducing this um, this this project funded by the Climate Resilience Program, funded by the Met Office. Uh, it started in early 2020, and as Mark says, we're now coming towards the end of the project. Um, so we've got lots to show, lots to squeeze into this time slot. So it's quite a, a high-level overview of the of eFlag, giving a flavour of all of the things that we've done. So it's very much this project about providing a prototype climate service to demonstrate the use of UK CP18 products, and specifically to develop hydrological products that can be of use to the water sector. It's uh, led by ourselves in UKCEH, and it also has um, BGS and HR Wallingford 
involved in the project. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the team. I'm representing eFlag today, but there's a, a vast number of people involved in this, and you can see names on this slide. Um, and I'll try and highlight names as I go through on the specific contributions, but I'd just like to thank all of the team for the work in eFlag and also for the inputs to this presentation. I hope I can do justice to all of their efforts over the coming 20, 25 minutes or so. So just to start off with, a um, just a statement really, and a reminder of the central issue which we're taking aim at with eFlag. And that is our continuing vulnerability to drought in the UK. Um, widely regarded as a very wet country, but obviously we do suffer from droughts. And this is a good example. Our continuing vulnerability was underlined in 2018 with this extremely arid summer period. Examples here from the paper led by Steve Turner showing the, uh, the aridity that summer and also illustrating that this drought had very serious impacts across a very wide range of sectors, um, including threatening water supplies. So we do suffer from droughts and we expect droughts to potentially become worse in future. So this is our challenge. Water resource managers and regulators need to manage such events and also to plan for the future. And to this end, we need to understand how drought hazard will evolve under climate change and factor that into planning. So this is very much what EFAG is all about. And there's a bit of text on this side. I'm not going to read it all out, but this is just from the proposal. But I wanted to highlight a couple of things um, in that EFLAG is doing. So as highlighted, it's very much about developing a climate service to help the water sector plan water resources. And to do that, it's all about delivering a high quality enhanced future flows and groundwater data set, hydrological projections that are based on the UK CPA team. Crucially, EFLAG is then working with the water industry and regulators to actually understand through a series of demonstration case studies how these projections can be used in practice. Now, I've used the word future flows, and I've done that deliberately because many people on this call, hopefully, will be aware of the future flows product that was released almost a decade ago. And in a sense, EFLAG is very much a successor to future flows. That was a data set, a nationally consistent data set of river flows and groundwater driven by the projections available at the time, UK CP09. And eFlag is very much about providing a successor based on UK CP18. Before going on, I'd just like to remind people that eFlag was, sorry, Future Flows was very widely used across a whole range of sectors in water resource planning and in regulation, but also for a whole host of other applications, including water quality, flooding, hydroecology, as you can see in this example here, and many, many others. So again, we hope that eFlag is, whilst useful for droughts and low flows, could also potentially find applications beyond. So what is eFlag? Well, I've given, I've shown this workflow from eFlag, a schematic of what eFlag is all about. And this is just to provide some structure for this presentation. I'm going to be talking in a moment about the climatology, taking UK CP18 and bias correcting that data. Then also in the methodology, how we've run that through a whole range of different river flow and groundwater models. And I'll be talking about those models and their evaluation, but only very briefly. I'm then going to talk about the drought analysis we've done with those projections, looking into the future. And finally, as I've said, EFLAG is very much about delivering these things with stakeholders through a set of of demonstrators and each of these projections feeds into those demonstrators at multiple stages and I'll be talking about some of the early outputs from those demonstrators. Just to highlight as well this really conveys what a complex modelling chain it is. There's 12 different um, members of the, the RCM ensemble at the start run through a whole range of different models and so on and so forth so there's a, a vast amount of data in eFlag and I'll be coming back to that uh, array of data and how you can access it at the end. Okay, so first of all, on the methodology, and this is very high level, a real whistle stop tour of, of how eFlag has been derived. At the starting point is obviously the UK CP18 data. And so what we've done is we've taken the um, regional projections from UK CP18, so that's a 12 member ensemble um, of 12 kilometer resolution RCM outputs, and it's a transient run. So this is this is data from 1980 continuously through to 2080. 
We've done a bias correction. I'm not going to go into the detail, but it's using a methodology we have applied previously in, um, in, in other projects. And also apply the snowmelt model to do partitioning of, uh, of precipitation. There's an example here of the uh, bias correction factors. Uh, so Rosie Lane and Alison K did this work. As you can see, this is just showing correction factors for each month in each of the different RCMs. I'm not going to go into any more detail today, but I will say that the bias corrected data, I'm, I'm going to be mainly talking about the flows in groundwater today, but the climatology data will also be being made available as I'll come back to at the end. So um, we also then wanted to select a series of catchments and boreholes, and I won't go into detail here other than to say that as with the original future flows, we've tried to select a very wide range of catchments and boreholes representative of the complex hydrology of the UK. And we also had lots of input from water companies and other stakeholders on the selections that we made. So hopefully provides a good set of, of, of catchments and boreholes of utility to a very wide range of end users. On Briefly on the river flow modelling, we have four models. So we have a series of, of lumped catchment models, two versions of GR, which is a French model that has been widely used in recent years in the droughts programme in the UK and shown to work very well in the UK. There's also PDM, which is a very, very long history of applications in the UK and was used in the original future flows. We also include grid to grid and the key difference with grid to grid is it is a one kilometre distributed model that potentially means we can provide projections uh, in future for ungauged locations. Each of these models run by uh, where, where necessary, calibrated and evaluated using observational data, as you can see here. And as I say, all of this work is building, as well as on the original future flows, on much of the work through the drought and water scarcity program that has recently come to an end. For groundwater, um, as with the original future flows, also uses Aquimod, um, the BGS lumped conceptual model. Uh, driven by the same data set as with the river flows. As well as being used for the original future flows, this model has been very widely used in other applications in the UK. In a key departure from previous work though, BGS are also using a distributed model, Zudrum. And this is a two kilometer model um, simulating groundwater recharge over the whole of the UK. So again, opening up potential for very high resolution outputs. I'm not going to talk much more about this today because it's, there's enough going on in EFAG and we're still analysing these recharge outputs. But just to highlight that there is this um, high resolution distributed model also available. And I'll be talking a little bit about how that's being used at the end. OK, so I'm now just going to show a few slides on the evaluation of these model outputs. Just briefly, there's two different ways we, we need to do evaluation for climate change studies. First of all, the, we need to just check the models work well in simulating current flows. So that's doing a typical hydrological model evaluation, looking at model simulations driven by observed climate data against real observations of flow and groundwater. And then the second stage is to say, well, we want to use these RCMs to make projections into the future. So we need to have confidence that the regional climate models do when run through hydrological models, uh, simulate flows well in the current era. So we take the outputs of models driven by the obs observed climate data as a benchmark and compare them to um, outputs driven by this ensemble of RCMs. I'll talk about these two stages and the outputs in a moment. Um, just to highlight, I'm not gonna go into detail, but there's lots of different metrics um, being used for model evaluation. And these have all been used previously in the droughts program and elsewhere, as you can see from the references on the slide. Okay, so this is just a, a high level um, overview of the evaluation. I'm not gonna go into detail because it's summarizing a lot of information on here, but just a few things to point out really. The first of which is that the models do a good job of simulating river flows across the UK in general. There are some differences between the models, as you can see with differences in these metrics where PDM doing a, um, a really good job of simulating low flows compared to, to some of the other models, but generally good across the flow regime and across these models. I should point out as well, a difference here, you can see that there's a much greater range of um, FITS uh, model um, 
evaluation for grid to grid. But the key point to remember here is that grid to grid is actually simulating naturalized river flows. The other models are calibrated, whereas grid to grid is not, and it's simulating naturalized flows. So some of these offsets from observations are actually due to the fact that the observations in many catchments are corrupted by human influences, such as abstractions and discharges. But the fact that grid to grid simulates naturalized flows is really important for applications, and we'll come back to that at the end. So again, just briefly to highlight the evaluation, this is showing it in map form. And again, the models are doing a good job across most of the country um, and for most of the metrics. There are some differences in individual catchments, as you can see. And so I think the key message I want to get home here more than anything is that they're doing a good job across the, for, for, for the simulations, but um, users will need to look at the metrics for each of the stations and we're providing all this information with eFlag, so all of the evaluations being provided um, so that people, when using the data, can choose stations and models to, that are suitable for their end applications. For groundwater as, a, as well, just the short version is that, again, all of the models are doing a, a, a good job of simulation for, uh, um, against observations. And in many of the cases, uh, are, are doing a really good job. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the general story with the, with the groundwater as well is that we're really pleased to see the um, that the um, models driven by um, by uh, the um, models driven by the um, climate data are actually mapping onto the the outputs from uh, from from uh, observed groundwater levels really well. Okay, so I'll just highlight briefly the second stage of the evaluation, which is how well are the models doing when driven by regional climate models. And the important thing here is that we're actually doing the validation using things like flow duration curves and, and other statistics, because the weather in the regional climate models isn't expected to replicate the day-to-day -day weather of, of observations. So you have to look at these long-term statistics instead. And what this is showing here is the models driven by um, the climate um, data in red, and then the gray lines, this is a number of gray lines, which is showing the models driven by the regional climate model outputs for the baseline period. And again, the key message is that across most of the catchments and the hydrological models, there's a subset of catchments being shown here. The regional climate model on ensemble does a good job of reflecting observations. There are some differences in the extremes, but overall they're doing a good job across the flow regime, which is really encouraging for their use going forwards in making predictions. And this is just to summarize that across the whole data set. So this is looking at the mean average error uh, for a particular metric, which is the Q70, which is the flow exceeded 70% of the time, or really like a 30th percentile. And this is the average error across each of the 12 regional climate models compared to the model observation Q70. And these colors generally showing low amounts of error across most of the country, albeit with some cases for some of the models, for some catchments, um, some, some anomalies which would need to be taken account of. Okay, so I'm now gonna um, give some of the headlines from the drought analysis. And again, there's a lot of material here. So it's a real high level canter through some of the key messages uh, from the drought analysis looking through the 21st century. One of the ways we're looking at droughts is through using threshold level methods. So this is essentially looking at applying a threshold to the time series and then looking at anomalies below that threshold to define droughts. When you do that, you can find, define a number of characteristics. So the duration, the severity or maximum deficit, and then the total deficit under these lines. What we've done is applied the Q70 threshold and then we've applied that on a monthly varying basis. So unlike the plot shown here, that threshold varies monthly. And that's really important because it allows us to look at droughts all year round and also to be able to look at very long droughts, the kind of droughts that affect, multi-annual droughts that affect Southern and Eastern England in particular. Okay, and so here's some of the headlines. This is a subset of the, um, of the river flow catchments for future flows. And this is, first of all, looking at time slices. So it's comparing drought durations in the baseline with two periods in, uh, in the future in the 21st century. 
the key message from all this is a lot of data on here, but the key message is that in most of the catchments, droughts are pro projected to become more prolonged in future, and especially as we move from the baseline to the near future and then into the far future. It's also consistent across the models. There are some differences between the models, as you can see, and there are also differences between catchments around the country, and we're just exploring those differences and how they relate to catchment characteristics. But the key message overall is that droughts will become longer in future in, this, in these E-flag projections. This is a similar metric. I'll, I won't pause on this because it's a similar message, but this is the drought severity and showing a similar thing that overall catchments of projectors have become more severe, whilst there are variations between catchments and models, the general message is of an increase in drought severity um, going into the 21st century. One of the key benefits to be flagged though is that we have these transient projections. So as well as looking at time slices, we can look at how um, droughts or drought characteristics will vary um, on a more interannual and, and interdecadal way going in through the 21st century. And here's some examples of some um, plots showing moving window analysis, showing Q90. So this is a low flow metric and how that evolves through the 21st century. And start off with the key message here is that as with other studies, low flows are projected to become lower to decrease in most catchments through the 21st century. There are variations, of course. You can see some variations between the models, between the hydrological models. And these, um, the ensemble, so the, the range of outputs from the different RTMs is also shown on these plots. So there's lots of uncertainty, lots of variations in, in, in the outcomes, but the overall message is, as we would expect, low flows projected to decrease um, in most catchments around the UK. With groundwater, it's actually something of a more complex story. In many cases, the median duration of so drought magnitude increases in the near future, but doesn't always increase in the far future. And this is a, a really interesting outcome. There's lots of investigations going on diagnosing this at the moment, but I mean, in simple terms, one of the things we know about these projections is that we will see increases in winter rainfall. And so it's likely that those increases in winter rainfall are resulting in increased recharge that is sort of offsetting the decreases um, in summer um, that you would be expecting to see. So it's not as simple as, simple a story as with low flows. Um, and also the other thing is there are very big differences between many of these groundwater boreholes. So local hydrological prop hydrogeological properties are really important. And again, this is borne out by the transient runs, showing that low levels are projected to decrease in most boreholes, but in some cases they are relatively stable going through the 21st century. And there's also very big differences between the RCMs, as you can see on these plots. One of the other key differences, and this is the final thing I wanted to show in terms of uh, analysis, is that um, E-flag, as well as being transient, is also spatially coherent. And this allows us to start looking at the spatial coherence of drought. This is very new work that um, uh, colleagues Amulia Chavaturi and Maliko Tanga have been doing, only really just started, but some interesting outcomes already. What they've been doing is trying to look at the coherence of droughts in the E-flag ensemble and whether that changes through the 21st century. In the observed era, you can see there are some droughts that are coherent across the whole of the UK, the droughts we know about in the 90s, for example. Looking forwards into the, um, through the E-flag projections across the models um, and across the time slices, we do also see some coherent droughts in future. So the question is, if we look at different regions around the UK, do we see differences in the amount of regions that are simultaneously in drought at the same time or not? And of course, this is really relevant for water companies looking at the question of being able to transfer water from one region to another. And so just an example of what we can do with E-flag. Um, this is showing the joint probability of regions, these regions here, the main water, water resource regions in the UK, being in drought at the same time. The darker colours are showing um, when they're not coherent. And as you can see here, Scotland is largely um, out of phase with the rest of the UK. 
Um, but the lighter colours are showing where they are coherent. So some near neighbour regions like in the English lowlands showing coherence in the present day here. The general message from this analysis though, this is using the same threshold as with the drought analysis, the Q70, is that often, well, when we look into the future, we don't really see any major changes in coherence between regions if you present the analyses in this way. However, if we present the analysis in a different way, if we look at the more extreme droughts, looking at the Q90 threshold, and if we're fixing a threshold based on the present day and looking at how uh, droughts will evolve in future relative to now, what we actually see is in some uh, cases, for some of these models especially, there's some quite big increases in coherence going through the 21st century that could have very profound implications for water resources planning going forwards. This work is underway at the moment and looking at all permutations of the different ensemble members, different ways of looking at drought and so on. But it's all with the aim of trying to help guide water managers on the likelihood of droughts being coherent across different regions going into the future and what the implications would be for water resources management. And finally, and this is even more early view work, um, it's only just started by Ben March and, and, and others at BGS also looking at the question of when groundwater and river flow droughts are coherent in future too. And this is an, another interesting issue. We have these extremely long transient time series going through the 21st century. So an absolutely massive amount of data to enable, to, uh, enable us to look at the, um, at the joint occurrence of river flow and groundwater droughts and what that might mean for a water resource management as well in terms of the likelihood of those um, those events being occurring simultaneously as you go into the future. Okay, I'd just like to spend a few minutes now talking about the demonstrators that we're doing with the water industry. So this is all being led by HR Wallingford, and it's very much around trying to take the flag outputs and demonstrate their use. There are two contrasting case studies, so we've been partnering with Welsh Water and Thames Water, demonstrating the use of eFlag data sets by taking the projections we've made and running them through um, water supply system models, but also crucially comparing them with the industry models that are being used, the industry hydrolog hydrological models that are being used at present. We're also going to be looking at comparing eFlag with existing um, climate data sets, such as the stochastic data sets used by the industry. We've engaged very widely with the water industry, as well as the two main partner organisations with the demonstrators. We've had a series of workshops and surveys, engaging with a very wide range of organisations to help shape these demonstrators and the sorts of indicators we use and the ways in which we're comparing eFlag against other products and so on. So I'm gonna show you some examples now, just briefly from some of the applications in Wales. So this is being undertaken for two different supply systems in Wales and also for Thames Water. And we have a couple of different modeling chains. One of which is here taking the E-flag um, river flow and groundwater projections and then running those through the, the supply system models from the company. And another one of which is taking the E-flag climatology and running it through the company's own hydrological models and thence through the supply system models. And so this is all allowing for an understanding of the impacts from these regional climate models, what the impacts will be on the water supply systems and key metrics um, that the water companies use. Overall, trying to help them to understand how system vulnerability and resilience will change through time. The idea is that the results will help inform guidance for how the water industry can better incorporate climate change into water resource planning, moving away from the kind of change factor approaches using at the moment and looking at alternatives such as linear scaling of impacts using these transient data sets and, and also using them to look at spatial coherence. So just a few exemplar outputs from this the work so far. This is uh, using the, um, uh, the taking the E-flag climatology run through a Welsh water model. Each of these rows, sorry, is a different reservoir in the Suca system in South Wales. One of which at the bottom is running through the, um, the Welsh water um, hydrological model and the others are using the E-flag projections for, um, so there's a number of different models from, from the E-flag ensemble as you can see here. 
There are some differences in the observational area between the models and between the company models and those used by coming out of eFlag, but also crucially some, uh, some you know, coherence in terms of what the key um, uh, periods of stress are in terms of the actual um, storage in these reservoirs through the observational period. So the idea then is to take um, the various different um, outputs from the, uh, the, the um, bias corrected climatology as well as from the flag projections and run them through these um, system supply models and look at what this means for the future. And I've got an example here of one of those outputs for one particular reservoir, as you can see here. This is showing the um, reservoir uh, storage um, and going into the future, so going through the 21st century. And you can see the 12 different ensemble members going down here. So this is the model chain A. So this is essentially using the water supply, water supply company's own hydrological model driven by the EFLAG climatology. And this is also being done separately for being driven by the EFLAG flows. But there's a lot of data here, so we've kept it quite simple and looking at one of the outputs. And this is showing um, some increasing system stress, so the darker colours, showing some stress going into the future according to um, the, the reservoir storage. And this is also showing up in terms of the flow duration curves, as you can see here. There's one particular example of the um, regional climate model. One, so the uh, RCM13 in particular is showing up as being quite different to the other, other regional climate models. Um, which has also been shown using change factors uh, in the past. So what this is enabling um, the, uh, the water industry to do, rather than just looking at change factors, is potentially looking at how using these uh, transient runs, able to see whether we can potentially see accelerations in impacts or thresholds in impacts. As you can see, it depends between the different regional climate models, but it's not like things happen in a, in, in, you know, according to time slices. There are different periods through each of these RCM models when impacts really start to occur. And so the idea is that this could be showing the water company something about when changes are likely to occur, which might be um, very relevant for driving investment decisions going, uh, going forwards. So all of this stuff is really about trying to do things differently and, and exploiting the EFLAG transient outputs and the spatially coherent outputs to say to do something um, that could potentially elucidate these future changes in more detail in a way that could be of more utility than what is being done uh, in conventional practice. Okay, and I'm now going to just sign off by telling you how you can get all of this data um, and, and use it going forwards. So um, all of the outputs are being delivered, the, all the data sets are being delivered in the Environmental Informatics Data Center at the moment as an open DOI data set. Uh, I was hoping it would be published by today, but it's um, just being held up with some of the guidance, but it's certainly going to be out and available by the end of November. Uh, next year, we'll also be providing access to individual stations through the National River Flow Archive so that you can get the data alongside the observational data from the NRFA. There's an awful lot of data though within the eFlag. You can see here an example of the schematic of all of the data uh, for groundwater and river flows. We've got several different models for each of them, observations and RCM runs. And so there are um, some 3,000 files within, it, within this data set. But because many of them hold 12 regional climate models, it's actually more like 25,000 different time series. So an awful lot of data to play with. As, as going back to the start, when we looked at the EFLAG modeling chain, 12 RCMs multiplied by all these models, there's an awful lot of information in here and an awful lot of uncertainty to explore. Um, in order to simplify things, we are there's a data paper that's also going to be submitted by the end of this month that will tell much the same story as I've told today around where the data comes from. And there's papers on the drought analysis that are in production and should be submitted fairly soon. I just wanted to say, as I said earlier on, as well as the groundwater and the river flows, the climatology is being made available. Within the open data set, you can get the groundwater and river flows uh, for each of the sites that we've modelled. But the gridded national data set we are going to make available next year as well, so that users can get the high resolution information. 
I've, I've alluded to the fact there's an awful lot of data on, on EFLAG. And so we're also over the coming, uh, the first quarter of 2022, going to be working on a portal to allow uh, users to access all of this information. If you've seen, hopefully you've seen some of the other portals we've developed in CEH to provide access to time series, mapping and visualizations of, of historical data. And in the same way, we will be providing a, a, date, a portal for to allow people to look at all of the outputs, the model evaluation, the future projections from eFlag um, and the drought analysis and be able to explore all of that in a dynamic and interactive way. So I'm just going to summarize with um, one slide to sign off. So it's an accessible, nationally consistent data set, um, transient and spatially coherent, which offers um, some significant advantages. It's an ensemble, um, so there's lots of opportunity to explore uncertainty within. We've already done lots of evaluation and analysis, um, which has been good for showing the utility of EFLAG for droughts and low flows, but we imagine and hope that it will also find use beyond those applications. And we're working with the water industry to understand applications and ensure that it can be embedded in practice and we can develop guide guidance accordingly. We're going to be carrying on the analysis, especially on the spatial coherence side, developing this accessible portal and extending the demonstrators, all finishing, the EFLAG will finish in March 2022. And at the end of EFLAG, so in February and March, there'll be a series of webinars which um, will uh, take all this forwards and in more detail be able to explore how you can use this data and give specific guidance on its use for water resources applications. So I'd like to invite everyone who's interested to watch this space for all of the data, the reports that are coming out over the next month or two, and also those webinars in the new year. The final thing I just wanted to highlight is it's not just um, eFlag uh, using, doing additional work. There's a series of follow-on projects at the moment one of which called CS Now is taking the gridded projections from eFlag, so the, few, the grid to grid projections, and is using those and exploring those uh, in more detail and also including uh, human inference. So I, I highlighted earlier on that grid to grid is naturalized and that allows us to bring in human inferences for the future as well. And the uh, gridded recharge data is also being explored in more detail by BGS. So thank you um, and thanks and acknowledgement to the funders. And again, thank you to the team um, for all of the efforts and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Jamie, um, for sharing that overview and also um, some more recent findings, they're good to see. Um, so I can see there are a number of questions coming in uh, via the Q&A, so we'll get to those in a wee second, but we're going to move over now to hear a user response to Jamie's presentation, and that is going to be provided by Stuart Allen. So Stuart is a principal scientist at the Environment Agency and leads on water issues for the climate change and resource efficiency team. Stuart has been with the Environment Agency for a number of years now and was part of the original Future Flow and Groundwater Levels project. So over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I was just uh, invited by Jamie and Mark to give a, a user reflection. Um, so um, I'm not going to keep you all too long because I think Jamie's done an amazing job already at outlining some of the opportunities that we've got with the the eFlag project and the outputs from it um, but I did want to um, take a couple of minutes just to sort of give my our kind of perspective on where we are and how we see things moving forward so if we could go to the next slide please um, I think what I wanted to, where I wanted to start was, uh, and Jamie touched on this at the beginning of his talk as well, um, is I do think it's important when we're looking at eFlag to sort of stop and pause um, and reflect on why we're actually doing this in the first place and why we are so interested in um, a project such as eFlag and drought in itself. Um, and the truth is, it's because it can be incredibly damaging in the UK. Um, it can cause extreme low flows. Uh, flow, the photo on the left of the screen is actually uh, the River Thames at Molesley Weir in 1921. Um, it can cause our taps to run dry. And of course, that is in the middle, um, the summer of 1976 with standpipes in the street. 
um, and it can cause our, our reservoirs to empty. Um, and the photo on the right is actually Hawes Water Reservoir in Cumbria, and it's a comparison of a photo taken in 95 with the levels that we saw in 2010. Um, and I think what all of these pictures sort of show is the degree of impact, uh, the damage that drought can present to us in the UK. Um, but it also reminds us that, of course, drought is not a new issue. Uh, we've always experienced droughts, but the difference is climate change. Um, in fact, the drought of 1921 was probably one of the worst we've perhaps ever seen. Um, but if we were to stop and pause for a second and think about the conditions of 1921, where there wasn't any climatic Im change impacts, but if we were to move forward and have a similar event, say in the year 2080, with the elevated temperatures and altered rainfall patterns, I think that's quite a sobering thought. Um, and that is really the reason why we're interested in a project such as uh, E-Flag, <clears throat> because it gives us the information that we need to know about how we can expect climate change to impact water resources and the things that we're interested in, such as drought. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. And impacts are so important to us because without us knowing how climate change impacts on our systems, we can't really plan properly or do anything about it. Um, and that is really that information is the benefit that we draw from eFlag because it gives us that, that uh, uh, in, in it, and the strength of the eFlag information in particular. Uh, well, there are several, but first and foremost, it is, of course, new and most recent and up-to-date science. As Jamie said, it is a kind of successor in title to future flows and it builds on UKCP18. So when we use information from a project like eFlag, we can be reassured that we are using the best available and we are making the best decisions we can in the circumstances. But it's not just about the, the, the age of the data um, and the products, it's also about the fact that it is nationally consistent. Um, as Jamie was saying, this opens up opportunities for exploring issues such as spatial coherence um, and different forms of analysis that we were not able to do previously. But it's also, um, a key element of this is it moves the debate on. Um, a data set like eFlag um, means we don't have to spend our time discussing or debating or reaching agreement on the information and data that goes into our analysis. We can instead spend our time do, debating the important things, which are the actions that we need to do to respond to the impacts. And I think that point about response is also key here with eFlag because the information is, got, is freely available and will be easily accessible. And not all actors in the water sector are, have the similar level of ability to handle uh, complex climate projections or even undertake um, extensive modelling projects. And the provision of... Um, effectively a, a kind of archive of information in the way that eFlag does is really key to those individuals because it allows them to, it unlocks the opportunity for them to adapt and plan properly. Um, but it's not just that ability that comes from the data, it, it is also the data itself and it gives us new opportunities. Um, the multimodal nature of the data that allows us to explore things around questions of uncertainty that we weren't previously able to go into in such a degree. Um, the time series allows us to do different types of analysis and different approaches to our assessments. And the further processing, such as the spatial coherence of drought, basically gives us information that we didn't previously have access to. Um, and, that, and that's important because it opens up exciting new um, opportunities for us because it gives us new understanding that we didn't have previously and that is important because it enables us to make better adaptation decisions and if we could just move to the next slide piece the, the the point with the better adaptation decisions is of course there is many things that we could do with information that comes from eFlag but fundamentally, it's going to assist us and help us plan for a, better, a more uncertain future. Um, now, that doesn't really matter. There's a few examples on the slide here, but it doesn't really matter whether that's for the adaptation reporting power or water resource management plans or drought plans. 
or any other planning framework for that matter. Um, the, the key point is the data that we get and the information that comes out of eFlag is going to be key to, uh, to the creation of the plans that, that we are taking forward and the actions that, that we identify, the, the, the actions that we need to undertake to adapt. And um, because these will allow us to um, better plan in a more secure way and re uh, secure the water resource going into the future, whilst also protecting the environment. And I think that final point is uh, an important one as well, because especially for us as a regulator, and if we just move to the next slide, please, um, because it's not just about drought as far as we're concerned um, and it, it's the wider environment has a, a part very much in, in the eFlag story because essentially what eFlag is doing is it's providing for us a hydrological series um, and that information is key and this is one of the major things as Jamie alluded to in his slides that was a real benefit and a real plus of the future flows work that we undertook previously because this the information that comes from a project such as eFlag can enable other activities. Um, so for example, water quality. Um, we can take the flows from eFlag, run them through water quality models and understand things such as, for example, changing uh, phosphates in the future and changing risk of ultimately of eutrophication, for example, in, under climate change. Um, but also the hydro, the full, because we are um, have modeled outputs of the full hydrological range, we also have a quite a lot of information in there that can assist our work on flood risk. Yes, um, eFlag does not, is not and does not provide us information about peak flood risk. Uh, however, it does give us information that allows us to, uh, uh, regarding the high flow conditions within which we can contextualize some of the peak flow modeling that we have and together of critical to our understanding and how we need to adapt to manage uh, future flood risk. So where does that kind of leave us? Well, I think if we just move to my last and final slide, um, I, th I think it's very short and brief really. I think I can summarize it quite quickly in terms of what we as a user see as the benefit of a project such as eFlag. Fundamentally, the climate ch is changing. Climate change is very real. Um, we need to be able to adapt. Um, but to adapt, we need sound, robust impacts information. And that is what eFlag gives us. And that's why it's so important to us as users. Uh, and I think that's where I will leave it for that. So thank you very much. And um, I will hand back to Mark. Super, thank you, Stuart. Um, so I can see you people's questions coming in, which is great. Um, so please keep on submitting those. And um, so the first one I think is for you, Jamie, if that's okay. And this is regarding the climate model inputs into your system as a whole. Um, what areas could do with improvement, uh, such as model biases or ensemble size or anything else? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And I'm not really, I'm not a climate model. I'm going to say that straight up. I mean, I'm very much interested in the, uh, the, the, the other end of the, uh, the equation. So, but yeah, sure. I mean, it, it is absolutely the case that, um, you know, we've had to make very pragmatic choices within, within eFlag, but we're, we're not using the whole range of UK CP outputs. We're using the, the regional projections for, for, for good reason. Um, but there's obviously a, a much wider range of, of climate model outputs that, that are out there. So there's already a huge amount of uncertainty has been shown through the range of different RCMs. Um, and as I sort of alluded to with one of the particular RCMs in relation to the water industry applications, there are some you know, interesting anomalies in, in one particular member that are, you know, quite, that, that, that are worthy of further investigation. So, so I do think that you know, we're, we're sort of taking UK CP18 as an output. We're doing a, a bias correction, which is, you know, enables it to be used, um, you know, for this particular purpose. But there's no doubt about it. That there are other, there's more work that could be done, more heavy lifting on the climate uh, input side. You know, just simply looking at other ways of doing bias correction is something we 
we've not had scope to do or time to do within within this project let alone looking at the wider range of climate model outputs that are out there so yes it's a good point that there are um other you know other other data sets other climate data sets are available and they would potentially show um, an even bigger range of uncertainties and, and biases that we need to take account of Okay, so moving on to a question more about the outputs. Um, so what analysis has been done of more severe droughts, um, say one in 100 year events? Uh, and are the changes in frequency or severity of these similar to the more moderate um, occurrences that you've been looking at? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I should, yeah, absolutely something we've been keen to do is to start looking at the extremes of the extremes if you like within within eFLAG. Um, we've been looking more at the as I say a series of thresholds Q70 and Q90 and Q90 is already quite quite severe but not we haven't really framed things in terms of return periods and obviously that's one of the things that the water industry is trying to do more um, increasingly looking at resilience to one in 200 and one in 500 year droughts it's fair to say that that is an enormously complex undertaking. And you know, the approach that's taken typically in the industry is to generate these very big stochastic data sets, um, you know, but they're not without their challenges in terms of interpreting those and also looking at those spatially. So this, I suppose, is we're doing something a bit different here in trying to actually, you know, have got a spatially coherent data set, looking at the droughts within those, but we are keen to, to sort of put things on a return period footing as well. And I've sort of alluded to in the spatial coherence work, I mentioned that some of the, the work we're just starting. Um, and one of the, the key things we're doing is starting to look at um, looking at drought coherence through the lens of return periods by actually doing some, essentially using some methods that are used in the floods literature to look at the um, you know, spatial de dependence of events of a, given, um, of a given recurrence interval. So that's something that we are keen to do with this data set. And even though, I mean, the good thing is we've got a lot of data. These are, because these are transient runs through to the end of the 21st century, there are reasonably long records to be starting to look at these questions around return periods. Thank you. Um, a quick and easy one for you to answer now. Um, you talked about the data portal. Um, are these data sets going to be made available through APIs? Uh, we weren't planning on APIs as such because the... Um, it's not, well, for me, the, the real benefit of all those APIs which we do serve up through the NRFA and various other things is, is to provide that sort of very, very direct programmatic access to dynamic data sets. Whereas because this is going to be a, a DOI um, data set, so it's a sort of frozen data set, as it were, um, you know, we're just, we're thinking more about making, uh, I mean, the data is all accessible on the EIDC and will be soon. So the portal is more about allowing people to explore the data in space, spatially and temporally, rather than provide access to it. Real people will be able to download the data from the portal um, and there'll be download options through the NRFA, but we don't really see the, the merit of an API as such at the moment. Thank you. Um, next question is, have you considered or modeled the point at which low river flows decrease to zero? Um, or are intermittent flows beyond the scope of your work? That's, that's a good question. The short answer to that is no. We haven't really been looking at intermittence within this data set. I can't remember now, I need to speak to Simon, who uh, led on the catchment selection and the drought analysis, whether there are intermittent streams in there or not. Um, but we haven't looked at that specifically. But because there is interest within some other people in CEH, Kath and Simon and others are looking quite specifically at, at flow intermittence and have a big interest in at looking at that in uh, climate change projections in the future. So it's a good question and something that would be good to look at, but it's not something we've done now. It's kind of beyond scope of the original E-flag as it were, but a really good thing to, to, to potentially investigate. Thank you. And there's one question that I uh, omitted to uh, ask it was right at the top so apologies for that and that is is there planned to be any oops sorry wrong one uh, about the boreholes Jamie I think you showed a, a slide with the observational boreholes um, is, is at the very start actually there's a noticeable gap apparently on the Pomo Triassic sandstones which run through Nottinghamshire and mm. southern Yorkshire um, technical question um, 
yeah. do you have the answer to why, why that might be the case? I don't have the exact answer off the top of my head, but I'm. But I'd need to speak to John Mackay from from BGS on that. But I suspect the it's just you know where the availability of, of index bore holes where models are set up and the degree of human disturbance is, is modest enough to allow the modeling to go ahead. That's certainly the case that on the river flow map as well, you might've noticed that there are some gaps on the river flow network. And that's because, you know, although we are including a mix of sites, including some that are disturbed and some that are not disturbed, there are some parts of the country, such as down in, in bits of East Anglia where um, it's just really, really difficult to find sites that you could model. So I suspect the gap is more of, of a pragmatic one rather than for any specific reason. But I can check that out with John Mackay from BGS and get a, a more detailed answer to the person who asked the question. Great. Thanks for that, Jamie. I think uh, that might be one to take away. And there are probably some that we're not going to get through as well today. So um, any subsequent questions um, we'll get back to you on. One final one. Um, will, again, on the data side, will the river flow grid to grid transient runs or change factors be published wider than just the 200 catchments? Yeah, that's a, an, another really good question. And I, so there's not a plan to provide access to all of the gridded data within, uh, within eFlag. Um, but I alluded to at the very end, we just briefly highlighted this CS Now project that's uh, underway at the moment, which is looking at the um, gridded data from, from grid to grid and will be providing, uh, I mean, it's blending that in, as I say, with human disturbances to look at future water availability. But I think the plan is within that project, there will be certainly some further development of portals and, and, and visualizations to allow people to explore all of these gridded data for the 21st century. Although I will say that's, I know it's Tiffany asking that question. So I imagine that's an, in, from the, an interest there from Scotland. And, and it's fair to say that that CS Now project is focusing on England. So I think this is, you know, there are some, the short version of my answer that would be that there's definitely scope for taking some of these gridded outputs and looking at them in future. Um, but at the moment that's, this follow on project is very England focused. So that if there's interest in that, that would be something, uh, good to discuss as well whether there's merit in in looking at some of the um higher resolution gridded outputs for other parts of the country in future super thank you jamie um for your presentation and also for answering those questions thank you stuart for your user perspective if there are any other questions that come in subsequently we'll uh, do our best to answer those via email so just the final slides now and that is very much um to draw your attention to upcoming webinars. Uh, so next week we have Hayley Fowler and many others uh, talking about um, future drainage workshop. And then the following week, uh, again, Wednesday lunchtime, uh, we have two speakers talking about um, resilient peatlands. So I'd just like to draw your attention to both of those so you're able to get those in your calendars for next time. OK, so thank you both for your presentation and thank you for your engagement as an audience and look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day.